Um, so update my. I have to create the slides. <laughs> okay, you have one minute for that. So uh, yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome for uh, yet another virtual meetup uh, for the Java user group. So we are today is a very special day for us. Uh, you can see that Nilesh and myself have a background of Vox days. Uh, the reason is that today was supposed to be Vox Day Singapore uh, 2020. We had to cancel it because of the coronavirus, but we hope to do it again next year. And we thought we should celebrate by having at least uh, one of our guest speakers, Josh Long, for a, a virtual meetup. So Josh uh, yeah, came twice to Singapore for Vox Days. Uh, he's Java champion, wrote many books. He is one of the faces of the Spring Framework and keeps traveling the world to do some uh, like demos and spreading the world about Spring Boot, that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you, Josh. Well, thank you. Is it uh, my time? Can I, should I go? Please. Is anybody else? Please. Okay, yeah. uh, let me get going then. Close that. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right. So. Let me share my screen, my friends. Sorry about this. All righty, my friends. Good stuff. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me see if I can move this out of the way. There you go. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I know that it's early in the morning for you. I'm glad that you are all here and uh, that you could join us. Obviously, uh, weird time in history. I really wished I could have been at uh, Vox Day Singapore. That's one of my all-time favorite experiences, uh, not just because I love Michael and the, and the rest of the team there, but also because of the food. And so um, I'm sad and, you know, I'm sad uh, ex ex experientially and also in you know, my stomach is sad. So just very sad in, in all sorts of ways that I can't be there in person, but at least we get to hang out together and do this. Um, we don't have a lot of time. So as always, I'm going to encourage you, please take note of this uh, presentation, the slide. This is arguably the most important slide that you're going to see uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, presentation of ours. It contains all of the code. It contains the coordinates. It contains information about me. My name is Josh Long. Uh, I am a, a, a Spring Developer Advocate. I'm the first uh, Spring Developer Advocate. I've been there for 10 years now. Uh, I am a Kotlin Google Developer Expert, GDE, whatever they call it these days. I'm a Java champion. Uh, and of course, I'm at your service. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, whatever, don't hesitate to reach out to me. There's my coordinates, my email, my Twitter, at Starbucks man on Twitter, my emails, josh at joshlong.com. And I'd love to talk. I'd love to, to be able to collaborate with you and uh, answer questions and whatever. And, and if I don't know, and that's very often the case, then I talk to people who are smarter than I am. People like Michael, people like uh, the spring team, people who will probably know the answer. And so that's my superpowers. I, I know who knows, right? Even if I don't know, I do know who knows. So that's uh, what I can do for you. Um, a little bit about me. I work on the spring team, as I said, 10 years now. I do training videos. These are online. You can find a number of them online. Uh, you know, videos on uh, spring and reactive programming and Kotlin and security and uh, building HTTP, REST APIs and continuous delivery and all sorts of stuff there, right? These are on Safari. Uh, you can find them. Uh, Safari is kind of a prefix uh, buffet style subscription. So you pay one flat uh, rate per month and you and then watch all the videos. It's kind of like Netflix, except that you don't get uh, stupider. So that's nice. Uh, I also have a book called Cloud Native Java that I wrote a few years ago that's all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud using Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry. The book is uh, available in a number of different languages. And I know that you in, in Singapore speak all sorts of different languages. Uh, of note, of merit, of relevance here uh, is the bird. Now, a lot of people, uh, don't know, but know this, but they ask, what is that bird? And uh, when we were developing the book, when we put together the book, there was a bit of a delay, okay? The delay was uh, not a big deal. It was just a little bit late, okay? It was not such a big deal, but it was, it was about a year uh, that, that we had to spend uh, extra to be able to release this book in form. And uh, what we eventually settled upon was a, uh, a bird for the cover called a blue-eared kingfisher. Now, this is near you. It's not where you are, but it's very near you. This bird harks from the uh, Indonesian Java Island. So it's a bird that is native to or indigenous to the Indonesian Java Islands. And it's a bird that is, uh, you know, that, that is native to the Java Islands. And birds, of course, they, they fly. So this is a bird that flies often through the clouds. So it's a cloud native Java bird. It's a 
it's a bird that's yeah, whatever. Anyway, moving on. There's that. I have a podcast, uh, and this podcast is every Friday. Lots of different stuff. Lots of different. It's just me talking to people that are smarter than I am, right? And that's a very low bar, right? It's not hard to find people that know more than I do. Um, and so I figured, gosh, wouldn't it be really swell if I could just turn on the microphone and uh, connect you, dear listener, with all these amazing people that I have the privilege of uh, interacting with on my day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, so this is just every Friday, anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I know that uh, a lot of you have a lot more free time of late, you know, what with the uh, lack of a commute and things like that. So um, please, uh, you know, subscribe wherever, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find me there. Uh, I also have a blog I do every Tuesday. It's called This Week in Spring. It's just me recapping all the latest and greatest in the spring ecosystem. I've been doing that for every January, every Tuesday since January 2011. I haven't missed one uh, in almost a decade, right? So um, the very beginning of January 2011. So uh, find that there. It's just a recap, all the news, blogs, uh, articles, videos, whatever, all that good stuff. And of course, I have a uh, video cast series, a screen cast series that I do on YouTube. It's called Spring Tips. It's a, a playlist under the Spring Source Developer uh, YouTube channel. And uh, you can find all sorts of good stuff there. There's 70, 80, almost 80 videos now on different topics. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that's basically it. So now we're going to actually focus on what we want to focus on, which is, uh, you know, uh, building applications today uh, destined for a cloud provider, in particular, uh, Azure. Right, so we're going to use Azure, Microsoft Azure. Now, Spring is um, nothing if not flexible. We are very, very keen on making sure that Spring works as well as it can on any different, on any given cloud provider, any target cloud provider. And so, Spring has, you know, the genesis of Spring Cloud. People may not realize this, uh, was a set of connectors that actually allowed you to write a Spring application that could then talk to backing infrastructure, things like your databases and your message queues and your caches and so on uh, in a generic way. So it was a set of bindings for databases and queues and all that kind of stuff that you could then dependency inject into your application. And this is one of the benefits of Spring, right? Is it's a dependency injection framework. And so you can write code that is insulated from the particular details of the resource initialization and acquisition pattern behind any particular thing. So you could write, a, you could write, write an application that talk to a javax.sql data source on your local machine for development, and then talk to a, a javax.sql data source that was bound to JNDI in your application server if you wanted to. Uh, and then you could talk to, uh, you know, if you're using an application server, I don't know who does that anymore, but that was, a, that was one of the original use cases, right? Uh, and then now, nowadays, just as easily, you can write code that depends on a javax.sql data source and that talks to something, you know, managed uh, wholesale and discovered by, uh, by talking to a cloud platform, something like, Microsoft Azure. So the original use cases were very much about connecting Spring applications uh, to cloud infrastructure. And then we took a few years, let's say four or five years, uh, to make Spring Cloud the best framework. Uh, we expanded it greatly to make it the best framework for building applications that run in the cloud. So this is not the same thing, right? This is, I want to write, I want to write applications that are cloud native, that, that take advantage of horizontal scale, that are agile, that are easily redeployed and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, recreated that that are that are you know uh, 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 continuously delivered right uh, small singly focused independently deployable reusable bounded context or microservices right so this is a the, the the thing that most defines I think today what people think of when they think of uh, Spring Cloud is a, a set of primitives to support patterns now these patterns have to, happened in the original uh, sort of uh, days to be dependent on different open source projects but it wasn't really dependent on individual cloud platforms. And eventually, a few years ago, let's say four years ago, three years ago, uh, people started using Spring Cloud and it became very popular. And then suddenly the Spring uh, ecosystem wanted to talk to different cloud providers in the way that we supported with that original, uh, those original sort of uh, connectors. So not only can we now build applications that are cloud native that, that, uh, that run well in an elastic cloudy like environment, but now there's been a number of different uh, cloud vendors that have helped us develop the best experience for Spring developers on their respective platforms. So um, uh, obviously there's Spring Cloud for AWS, that, that's a, an option. That's actually the least well-developed uh, implementation that we have. Uh, and the reason is because just not that many people want to use it, right? And, and the people from uh, AWS don't really uh, 
give us as much help as perhaps uh, some of the others do. So it's just not as progressed uh, as, as some of the others. Uh, then there's Google Cloud, there's Spring Cloud for Google Cloud or Google uh, or GCP, right? So Spring Cloud GCP is a, is a whole project and that's co-developed by the Google engineers and by uh, the Spring team, right? So we're happy to help. We obviously are very happy to help and do all that kind of stuff, but we can't take the lead on all the stuff because it's just too much. So the, the Spring Cloud for Google Cloud, huge offering, right? Uh, Spring Cloud for um, um, Aliun, right? Ali, Ali Cloud, Ali, Aliun is the Alibaba Cloud. It's a bit like their AWS uh, to, to Alibaba's at Amazon, right? They have uh, uh, a Spring Cloud offering that's amazing as well. So really, really interesting offering. But then one of my favorite ones, one of, my, one of the ones that's become most promising is the uh, Spring Cloud for Azure integration, right? Um, Spring Cloud for Azure is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, this is all coincident. Uh, it's all sort of happening at the same time as Microsoft has become very, very good about open source. They've become a legitimate concern in the open source space uh, and not a concern in a bad way, like a, a going concern, right? A, 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 a legitimate name, right? Um, and so it's just been very interesting to watch these, uh, these amazing efforts that are coming out of Microsoft and all the open source stuff that they're doing. Uh, not the least of which, of course, was uh, hiring a bunch of people to work on Java at Microsoft, right, to uh, to make that a better experience. So really, I've just been super impressed. All of us in the Spring Team, I think, have been super impressed with what has been happening uh, with uh, with Microsoft over the years. And so when um, when they wanted to work on Spring Cloud for Azure, we were very excited to help them. I myself have spent time in uh, in Redmond, uh, Washington, which is a state that's about a thousand miles north of where I live in San Francisco, maybe it's a little, little bit less or a little bit more, I don't know, but very quick plane ride, let's put it that way. It's like an hour and a half, right? Uh, maybe two hours. Um, and I spent my, I've spent time with the, uh, with leadership there. And I've spent a lot of time actually with uh, engineers um, in Shanghai, in China, right? Uh, there's a large Microsoft uh, installation there in, in China. So just, just really incredible uh, engineers worldwide that are working on making Spring Cloud for uh, Azure, a really compelling story. So today, I, I cannot hope in the meager time that we have allotted to show you everything that's possible, okay? I, there's nothing, I, there's no way I can do that, even if I wanted to. Um, we're gonna just look at a small sampling of features, but I want you to know that uh, they have thought of everything. So if you wanna do Active Directory with, uh, with um, Spring Security, you can do that. Uh, you've got, reactive and non-reactive spring data implementations that talk to uh, both Azure uh, Cosmos DB and uh, to uh, Microsoft SQL Server, right? Uh, that's already done for you, right? Uh, there's um, integrations for, gosh, I mean, just everything. If you want to do distributed tracing, if you want to do monitoring, if you want to do uh, metrics collection, if you want to do, um, uh, you know, MongoDB or Cassandra or, or uh, Graph, Gremlin, Graph style uh, interactions, all that is supported in terms of a, a, uh, a respective Spring API, okay? So they've actually provided integrations that work in a natural way for Spring developers. Really, really amazing experience. So all of that I thought was really cool in of itself, but then then they reached out to us and said, hey, uh, you know, as the number two cloud platform, right? Azure is uh, by, any, by any measure, they're, they're the number two, maybe even one day number one, but they're certainly the number two largest uh, cloud platform, the infrastructure as a service offering out there. And uh, with Spring being the number one you know, most, most widely used sort of de facto uh, standard in the Java JVM ecosystem. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could mix uh, and, and marry some, some of these uh, strengths, our respective strengths, uh, to build the best um, sort of offering for Spring developers on Azure. And so we created something called Azure Spring Cloud, okay? Now, Azure Spring Cloud is, you just go to your account, it's, um, you can create a new one, for example, uh, and uh, you fill out the information and it spins up in Azure Kubernetes uh, service-based platform as a service. Okay, now, uh, don't worry. I, I can see some of you looking for your escape hatch button, trying to run away from the talk. There's no YAML, okay? It's fine, you, you, you can still be productive. It's a really, really nice experience. You just, you just use Azure Spring Cloud and you can build a jar and then deploy it to that, right? Um, and it, it automatically understands things like uh, service registry. So if you want a, a Eureka, a Spring Cloud Eureka-based service registry, it'll automatically configure that for you. If you want to use, uh, centralized configuration with Spring Cloud Config Server, it'll automatically give you one of those as well. If you want to automatically integrate tracing, uh, distributed tracing for your service calls from one node to another, it'll give you that as well. So it's pretty trivial to do this uh, and to just deploy dot jars. So there's no 
Docker containers. There's no, uh, you know, manifests or deployment descriptors or any of that kind of stuff. You just give it a dot jar, Spring Boot, uh, so-called fat jar and deploy it to the platform and you'll have a URL with the service that's up and running load balanced in no time. Okay, so that's a whole other thing. We could definitely talk about that at length, but I'm gonna focus on just writing code that talks to uh, uh, Azure backing services. Because for me, the most compelling opportunity here is to be able to use all this amazing stuff that Azure uh, office, offers, right? The, um, the, the backing services, all these things that you can see uh, sort of outlined here. That's compelling to me. That's what's super interesting. Obviously, Azure Spring Cloud, the ability to run your application uh, in a very convenient, very reliable way, obviously super interesting in and of itself. And hey, just being honest here, if you, if you use Azure Spring Cloud, we make money too. So I, you know, I love that. But let's face facts, not everybody's going to use that, right? And so what I want you to understand is that if you're running on top of Azure Kubernetes, or if you're just using one of their web, web runner things that they, uh, they, that they have, um, uh, you can you can do that too. It's just the integrations with all this backing services that still stand, uh, you know, that stand on their own. They're really really compelling. So in order to demonstrate all this, I'm going to go ahead and build a new application. We're going to go to my uh, second favorite place on the internet. Obviously, my first place has always been and will always be uh, production. This is start.spring.io, and here I'm going to build an application. Unfortunately, I can't use the latest and greatest 2.30 yet. Right? Some of the things I want to show you today aren't quite yet upgraded. Actually, a few of them are. So I actually did give a go. I did give using 2.30 a shot and um, I was pretty close, but I was like, ah, I, you know, people aren't gonna upgrade to this tomorrow anyway. And Spring Boot 2.30 just came out uh, uh, like a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. It's, it's really, really new. So I love 2.3. I think you should use 2.3. And there's a couple reasons that you should use 2.3. First and foremost is that um, when you use Spring Boot 2.3, what you get is, native Docker image uh, generation support. So I won't uh, belabor that point, but what you need to know is that now you can take a Spring Boot application and then do Maven Spring hyphen boot colon uh, build hyphen image and it'll generate a Docker image uh, that'll, that you can then publish to uh, Kubernetes or to Docker Compose or to your local Docker image, uh, you know, Docker, just your local Docker daemon or whatever, right? If you're using Mesos or, or, or whatever, you can do that. And of course you can deploy to Cloud Foundry and to Azure and all that stuff, right? So lots of different, um, options there for your Docker image. And the thing is, that's really good. The thing that's so compelling about that is that we're not, you know, the, the wisdom um, that's required to operationalize a, a Java application uh, that has been accrued by the Spring team over many years, that wisdom is baked into that container. Uh, you see, we participate, we helped co-found something called the, the, build spec, the build pack spec, right? Uh, this is a cloud native computing foundation specification. And the whole idea is that um, you give this build pack an artifact, be it a dot jar or a dot dial or dot exe or dot, uh, you know, a Python uh, application or a Ruby application or go binary or whatever. You give that application to the, the build pack and it'll create a file system that has everything required to run that application. Um, uh, including a JDK for a Java application, maybe a dot, maybe a Tomcat if you're using a dot war, you know, web application archive. So all this stuff that you need to be able to certain to, to operationalize that application, it gets done for you in a consistent way. So now you have cookie cutter sort of uh, deployments to production. You can give it a dot jar and you get the same thing on the other side of the line every single time. So you're, you're not wasting time with snowflake configurations and trying to figure out why this one little switch may, matters more than that. Uh, and you don't have to learn all this stuff for each new application. Remember, the key to velocity here is consistency. You want the ability to be able to get something into production and then cycle on that to rinse and repeat as quickly as possible. That gives you agility and that's key uh, when you move to microservices. Indeed, that's I think the most compelling feature. That's one of the things I love about that. And you, I encourage you to uh, uh, wait for, I think, uh, Michael, didn't you say next week there's, a, there's somebody gonna be talking about that? Yeah, that's correct. Next, week, like... next uh, Thursday. Can you can I can you mention the name? Yeah, Sergi Alma. So he'll be talking ah. about two, three, oh. So Sergi Almar is amazing. It's, I'll be I'll, I'll probably uh, try and watch that one as well, especially if it's at this time of day. Uh, he's awesome. So I look forward to that one. I don't want to steal the thunder. The other thing that's nice about two three, and this isn't strictly speaking a thing that comes with two three. It's a Thing that you can do with 2.3 that happens to work best with 2.3 uh, is native images, right? So we have this thing called um, 
uh, in the ecosystem, in the Java ecosystem, there's been a lot of interest, a lot of uh, uh, fascination around this new thing called Graal, G-R-A-A-L. Graal is a C1 just-in-time compiler replacement that has been developed by Oracle Labs. It's a separate project uh, than Oracle's Java team, uh, but they are, you know, two sides of the same coin, right? One is generate, one, the original goal of that C1 replacement was to build a better just-in-time compiler. And that just-in-time compiler is hotspot, right? That's the old one. Uh, that's a tangled code of spaghetti C++ code. So the team eventually sought to build a Java first, Java native uh, C1 replacement. So you can actually use OpenJDK and just swap out uh, the Growl uh, hotspot instance, or you can just download Growl's OpenJDK distribution, which has that as uh, an option, right, as a default. So that's really compelling in of itself, and you gain a lot. You gain like 10% in some applications, uh, you know, less memory, less, uh, you know, less delays and all this stuff. Already compelling in of itself. But what most people talk about when they think about Growl is not that. Uh, they, they think perhaps of the polyglot runtime. So you can actually run Python apps and JavaScript apps and Java apps and, and R apps in the same JVM. That's interesting in of itself. But that, that's not also the most popular thing. What they most often talk about these days, it seems, at least to my, uh, to my um, eyes anyway, uh, is the native image support. So Growl has figured out, hey, it's pretty interesting that we can figure out when to inline this Java code and turn it into native code, right? When we can turn it into machine code that actually executes really quickly. What if we just did that proactively ahead of time, right? What if we turned the whole application uh, from a interpreted Java application into a compiled Java application into a, um, with, with, with bytecode into a native application. We did that all before you ever ran it, right? So that's what this native image builder does is it, it turns your Java application into a native image, uh, um, uh, an architecture specific image. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to tell about, you need to tell it about all the opportunities that you have for doing anything dynamic. So if you want to load a class from a, a, a file system, if you want to reload a class or do a proxy or anything like that, any kind of reflection, any of that stuff needs to be made clear upfront. If you're willing to do that, then Growl can turn your Java application into a native image that boots up in fractions, you know, orders of magnitude faster than what you were dealing with before. And it can take tens of megabytes of, of RAM and memory instead of hundreds as, as your typical Java application will do. Even Hello World is gonna take more than hundred megs of RAM uh, if you're gonna run it for a long enough time, okay? So we're going to, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not gonna show you all of this because again, I've got a Spring Tips video on this. You can watch Growl native images, right? Watch that. There's this video and there's also a blog that accompanies it. Oh, I guess they're redeploying Spring.io right now. That's awkward. <laughs> um, uh, that'll come back in a second and you can watch it, but there's a, a video and a blog there that details everything I'm showing you in depth. And the reason I'm not gonna show you everything right now is because it takes a considerable amount of, amount of time. But what you need to understand is that I've taken two applications, two bread and butter kinds of applications. One's a traditional Spring Data, JPA and Hibernate application uh, that uses Apache Tomcat and servlets. And I compiled it into a Growl image. Now, the, the feature that we released is called the Spring Growl feature. The Spring Growl feature is a Java agent that runs alongside your application monitoring anytime you do anything kind of tricky with your application, such as proxies and reflection. And it captures all that and logs it and creates the configuration for you so that you can then pass all that configuration to the Growl compiler to have it do a good job of con converting your code into a native image. That takes a long time. It took 10 minutes for this servlet application and for this uh, uh, you know, Spring Data JPA servlet application, right? So I'm not gonna show you, I'm not gonna sit here waiting 10 minutes for a compiler. I've already done it and you can watch me do it in the video. Uh, but here's the application, okay? I mean, uh, that one took, that one started up in 0.886 seconds. That's because I had to wait for network IO. There you go. That's much more typical. 0.196 seconds to start up this application, right? Localhost reservations, et voila. Okay, there's my, my data from my endpoint, okay? So that's a traditional Tomcat application in, what did I say? What did we, what did we say? It was point, 0.35 seconds. There you go, 0.19. So, you know, less than, 0.2 seconds, one, one fifth of a second to start up the application and have it online. And if you look at the memory footprint from this thing over time, it's not gonna uh, seesaw, it's not gonna, it's not gonna uh, zigzag very much. It'll just be pretty reliable, pretty low for the entire life of, of, of its behavior. Um, that's awesome. Uh, you can also look at reactive applications. And I think I've even addressed this group on reactive programming before. I've got a reactive application. Again, a typical bread and butter, spring data, 
a reactive uh, uh, R2DBC talking to a SQL data database, just like the traditional application does. Uh, but it's also using, it's also got a web endpoint. So here uh, I've got the application. And by the way, uh, these things are huge, right? They're much bigger than the fat jars because they have their own runtime. These are not Java applications anymore. They're native code. So they don't need a JDK, but they embed their own virtual machine, if you will, their own runtime called Substrate VM. Uh, so this is a 90 megabyte application. But here, if I run that, okay, slow on the first go, 0.41 seconds. That's a long time. I don't know why the first go is always so slow, but there you go, 0.096 seconds, right? So less than one tenth of a second. And that's pretty typical. And uh, here's that endpoint with an extra record, right? So you can see it's different. Uh, and if I go here and kill that, refresh, it fails, right? So very, very, very quick experience. I, again, I won't get into this for, for too long. I encourage you to check out this great thread by uh, my friend and fellow uh, developer advocate, but he's, he works for Azure. Um, <clears throat> Julian Dubois, he talks about using Spring Boot's Graal VM image support uh, to, to, to work in tandem with Azure functions, right? Okay, so that's a very cool uh, use case. You can build native images that respond to whatever you want to do in Azure functions using Spring Cloud functions. So check that out, okay? Uh, okay, now let's us get underway. We're going to use 2.27. Having said all that, having uh, talked up the opportunity here with Spring, that, Spring Boot, Spring Boot 2.3. I have to regretfully use 2.7 for the moment. But again, it's getting better. Just check back in a week. It might even be better by then. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application here. I'm going to use Java 11. Um, and I'm going to add some dependencies. Okay, so I'm going to bring in the Azure Spring Bomb. That's the uh, bill of materials, right? I'm going to bring in the Azure Storage Support. I'm going to bring in JDBC. I'm going to bring in uh, Lumbach, which is a compile time annotation processor that makes life just a little bit less uh, uh, verbose if you're using Java. And I'm going to bring in the uh, web support. Okay, so I've got Azure support, I've got storage, I've got uh, JDBC. Oh, I want Microsoft SQL Server as well. So you can see here on the start that spring, you know, we've already got a number, a handful, a complement of the Azure dependencies here for you to use. Um, but, uh, but, 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 but. Uh, not all of them, and that's because it would be an exhausted, it, to be exhausted, we'd have to have dozens and dozens of checkboxes. So what's most important is that you get this support uh, dependency here. That'll bring in the Maven bill of materials dependency that then in turn, you can use to import without qualification, almost all of your dependencies, uh, save for one. And I'm gonna show you one. I'm, at, I'm gonna actually have to manually add dependencies to my build, which, you know, I can hear you gasp, uh, to, to be able to make this application work today. So let's hit generate and go to the downloads directory here. Okay, UAO azure.zip. That'll start up in my IDE. Doesn't all that much matter what IDE you're using, obviously. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Spring, then what you need to know is that we care about integration, we care about being open. So, you know, we, we, we don't want our experience, you know, we, we don't want your productivity experience to be contingent on some IDE tooling, right? So uh, so all everything I'm gonna show you here can work with Eclipse or NetBeans or the open, open source community edition of uh, IntelliJ or whatever, okay? Now I've got a number of different dependencies here that I need uh, that I've got already in my class path, but I'm gonna add a few more, okay? I need just a few more. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna copy and paste, if, I, if you will, um, to, to bring all those dependencies in, okay? So, Forgive me for a second. All right, let's see. Pasting. Okay. Good. So there's my dependencies, some of which are duplicated, right? You can see I've got the Azure Spring Boot Starter. Uh, obviously, that's a common dependency. Don't need that. It's already there. Once anytime there's a, a yellow highlight there, that means it's duplicated in the um, declaration. Not strictly speaking a problem, it's just a warning, right? There's the Azure Storage Spring Boot Starter. I want that, but I've already got it twice. Don't need it again. Don't need the Azure Spring Boot uh, Web Support. I, I, sorry, the Spring Boot Web Support. Don't need the JDBC support. You know, again, duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. Uh, and there we go. That seems to be better. So now the only things that are different is I've added this. This is a um, Microsoft Azure uh, uh, Spring Cloud Stream binding, okay, for Azure service bus, which we're going to look at today. I was going to show you the native API. And in previous versions of this talk, I've actually shown the native API for Azure service bus, which doesn't look, it's weird. Azure service bus um, has some of the most brilliant people in the industry because my background is messaging. So I love Azure service bus. It's, it's got some of the most brilliant people in the industry 
uh, working on it. Clement Masters is, for example, one of the people that uh, helped build it. And, it. and it looks and feels very much like AMQP. And I think you can even use it like AMQP or JMS. But I, you know, I figured I would just show the native API because otherwise I, you'd just be watching a, a, an AMQP demo. But recently they've been watching, they've been, sorry, they've been building a service bus binding for Spring Cloud Stream. So I'm going to show you that today. Um, uh, in a, in a, but that's not yet part of the release train. And there's a couple of reasons for that, I think. I can, I'm conjecturing. I think that the, the, bind, the dependencies here right now are Spring Boot dependencies, whereas this is very clearly in the Spring Cloud train. So at some point, there's going to be an aggregate, I hope, Spring Cloud bill of materials thing. You know, that's my hope, my goal. I, I would love to see that. Uh, and then that'll bring in all the Spring Boot stuff and all the Spring Cloud stuff, right? Um, okay, so we've got that. We've got the storage dependency here. We've got the core Spring Boot starter. That is actually redundant. It's implied. This is implied by all the other ones, but never hurts to have it. We've got Microsoft SQL Server, uh, our dependency there. And then that's about it. The other thing that you need is the dependency management section, right? That's, all, that's done for you by the Spring Boot. Uh, the Spring Initializer starts at Spring.io. Um, but after that, I think we're all, we're okay. We've got, I'm going to be using Cosmos DB here, but I'm going to use the MongoDB driver. That's one of the nice things about um, Cosmos DB, okay? So the other thing we're going to need is some configuration. And this is, I think, the best and worst part of Azure for me, okay? Um, and what I mean by that is every single thing in Azure has its own configuration, uh, its own connection strings, its own way of saying, hey, you're going to connect to this thing. Um, it'd be nice if that was just done for me, you know, if I could authenticate once and then, you know, not have service specific usernames and passwords, right? Uh, if you use, um, if you use AWS, they have a very, 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 very verbose uh, security model that relies on um, uh, permissions and roles and uh, you know entitlements and all this kind of stuff that it can, it's exhaustive, but it's it is exhausting as well, right? It can be very tiresome to try and figure all that out. So I think that's a little overbearing for the average use cases. It, you know, it's locked down to the point where you, you can you can't be productive unless you spend weeks trying to automate security, right? Um, uh, on the other end of the spectrum is something like Google Cloud, which uh, you've got one authentication. If you log in once, then suddenly everything's available to you. Right. There's no, it's, it's, you can lock things down, but by default, things are just nice and easy and easy, easy to use. And you have to connect it just once you connect to Google cloud and then everything that Google cloud that has to offer is available to you. And you don't have to authenticate or send passwords and museums and all that stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, they have a much smaller set of stuff, right? Google cloud is a very small curated list of services. Whereas AWS and Azure are much more in the, here's everything you could possibly want kind of a end of the continu continuum, right? So what I've had to do is I've had to, Provide configuration connection strings. And this is stuff that I have in my local environment. I'm not going to show you these connection strings in my property file. You might accidentally see some of them as we look at some of the screens today, as we look at some of the screens in the portal. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give them away if I don't have to. These portals, this portal is how, how I'm going to drive everything. But keep in mind, uh, Microsoft Azure can be very easily uh, manipulated if you use Terraform, if you use uh, the native a CLI, there's a very nice CLI that you can use for Azure Spring Cloud as well as for all the other uh, Azure uh, infrastructure. So whatever suits your fancy, right? Whatever, whatever works for you. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the common use cases here. Obviously, we're going to start with the low-hanging fruit, uh, the kind of stuff that is fairly familiar to everybody, right? So let's talk about um, talking to Microsoft SQL Server. I've got a Microsoft SQL Server instance over here. So if I go over here, you go to SQL Databases, uh, and you can configure a SQL database, then uh, actually that's con configuring a SQL, a SQL database, then you have to configure the database instance. So you have a SQL server, then you have the database uh, and you have to configure the, the, the um, uh, credentials and all that stuff, right? You have to configure that when it launches so that you can then log in to that uh, using the information that's been that you've been given, right? So if I look here, do I have, that's my database. One thing you're gonna need to remember is to set the server firewall or rather if you're doing it on your local machine, as I am, make sure you set up a rule to exempt part a particular IP address. Because again, here by default, it's locked down, you know, for better or for worse. I understand why it's just a little off-putting if you're trying to get started quickly. Uh, and then otherwise, you've just got something there. You've already got a, an instance uh, and you can talk to it. You can configure your um, your your SQL clients to 
to work with it and so on. There's a query editor here. Um, you would need the password. So I'm not gonna, do I have the password? That's the easiest way to get that password. I have the password, but uh, suffice it to say, I've got a table in there, uh, which has a, a, uh, a, it's called customers. It's a single table called customers that has three rows in it. So it's customers with an ID and a name. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a simple, simple application that talks to that. And again, nothing fancy here. Very just very straightforward stuff. You've seen this kind of stuff before. I'm saying connect to Azure, uh, tech, connect to Microsoft SQL Server using um, Azure and uh, connects and using JDBC. Again, if you've ever used uh, any kind of JDBC uh, infrastructure, then this is not uh, not particularly surprising, right? I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, I don't I don't know why I'm showing you. SQL Server instead of Postgres. I suspect more people are using Postgres, but, and I love Postgres, you know, and you, you can get Postgres and MySQL on uh, Microsoft Azure, but Microsoft SQL Server, is, it holds a special place in my heart, right? Uh, it's short and sweet. It's like, it's legendary. That thing has been around forever. And sure, you can run it for yourself, but wouldn't you rather Microsoft, who of course built it, uh, do that for you, right? Or at least they they took, took over it since Sybase, right? So, uh, it's a fully managed thing. How cool is that, right? You don't see that kind of solution in other contexts. Imagine buying a car that you can drive as fast as you would like and on which the manufacturer will guarantee you any and all maintenance and repair, right? That's what you're getting here. Even if the car is hit with an asteroid, they're gonna make sure you're, you're, you're okay, right? This is why running Microsoft SQL Server on uh, Microsoft Azure is so appealing to me. The drudgery of ownership is removed, right? Uh, this is why a lot of people rent houses instead of buying homes, even though lucratively, you know, financially, it's a much better deal to buy a home. They just don't want to deal with the upkeep. They don't want to have to clean the hedges and, uh, or, you know, cut the hedges and drain the, 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 the pipes and so on. So the burden, burden of ownership is gone. And obviously SQL Server in its own right is, uh, is amazing. It's been around for since 1989, right? So it's probably older than a lot of people in this audience. It's routinely ranked up there with the likes of Oracle's database and PostgreSQL as being among the most feature filled databases out there. It's been built over decades to serve enterprise use cases. And it's even got things that like that other databases, including the venerable PostgreSQL sometimes lack, right? Uh, Postgres uh, only recently uh, had a really good story for transparent data encryption. But of course that's one of those things that's built into SQL Server for decades, right? Uh, um, just really, really amazing. So SQL Server of course had its uh, background, its origins as an enterprise grade database that run on one operating system, which was, who can guess? I can't see any hands, but if any of you suggested Windows, eh, you're wrong, right? It's actually OS2. So uh, it actually worked on OS2 first and then Microsoft joined Ashton Tate, was it? I think Ashton something uh, in Sybase in the late 1980s to create a variant of Sybase SQL Server that worked on IBM's OS2 that was jointly developed by Microsoft at the time. Uh, the first version of Microsoft SQL Server that we know of today and that served uh, as Microsoft's entry into the enterprise level database market uh, competing against Oracle and IBM and other databases came out at version 6.0 and it was designed for Microsoft Windows NT. So again, long history, just a really amazing thing. And as a as a person that has been at a lot of startups, I've always said, gosh, I wish I could have access to a, a, like a SQL Server license, right? I want to be able to use this in my database. If you're running, if you're a small company and you can use MySQL or Postgres, of course you're going to do that, right? But there are some things I've always just said, gosh, I wish I had access to that thing. So now it really, I really like that I can, I can just use it. It's just there, right? So let's go ahead and build an application uh, that talks to uh, SQL Server. I won't spend a lot of time here because it's a trivial toy demo, uh, but you know, customer. Uh, private uh, string, we're gonna create a string. We have a string column and an integer ID, a primary key. Uh, and the ID here is an, it's just a, I don't even think we have to do that, right? Yeah, let's just do this. Let's just do a DTO kind of thing. And I'm gonna create a required args constructor and create some getters uh, for the object as well. They're using lumbuck. So there you go, that's the essence of what I'm trying to express here. Um, what I need to be able to see that in action is to create a listener, an event listener. So SQL server demo. Okay, and I'm gonna create an event listener. Application ready event class public void. Um, go SQL server, go, right? There you go. And add component and so on. So now I'm going to, uh, in order to be able to 
make this work, I'm going to use the venerable JDBC template, right, from uh, Spring. Um, this template is a, uh, it's been around forever. It's been around for like 18 years, right? It's, it's one of those things that everybody in Spring has used at some point or another. It's super useful. One of the things that made made so convenient was making talking to uh, JDBC less painful, way less painful, right? So select all from uh, customers is the table. By the way, <laughs> you can do this if you want, uh, DBO dot customers, right? You can do that if you want to do that, but you know, why would you, right? Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each row that comes back and map it into a customer object and then uh, just work with it, right? So log it out, customer. Okay. Good stuff. So there's this. That'll give me a collection of objects. Let me see here. Customers. Good. New customer. And rs.get integer is ID. rs.get string name and voila that's the entire thing okay that's the entire sql server demo we make the font a little bit smaller there there you go so when that start when the spring application context starts up it's going to see this uh spring is spring boots automatically going to send you know it's going to hydrate a connection for me to my sql server uh instance there um and we're good to go let's do that run Oh, I didn't print anything out. I got the database name. I got the data, but I, did, I didn't visit each record. So let's do that quickly here. All righty. It is so cool that I can just use, I can pay as I want to go and use my Microsoft SQL Server. That means it's just accessible to any startup. If you want one of the, world, one of the world's best databases by far, you, know, you can just now use it. That's, to me, that's super cool. There you go. There's three records from SQL Server. Not a big, not a fancy thing. I just want you to know how easy it is to do. Uh, the next thing I want to show is, of course, um, you know, we've got SQL, but, you know, I already mentioned, and I'm, it, feels, it feels a pity to not show Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB is a really, really piece, interesting piece of technology. Cosmos DB was a, it is a database that was uh, um, designed recently, right? And a lot of people originally were a little put off by the fact that it, it, um, support so many different protocols. How could something so, support so many different protocols and APIs and be good at any of them? And it turns out, yeah, actually, it is really, really good. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server is a great database, but yes, you could have run that yourself. You could have run that on your own local machine uh, at, in your own data center. Uh, you don't need Microsoft to do that. But in order to get some of the scale and some of the guarantees that Azure Cosmos DB gives you, um, uh, you need something, you need, you need somebody to operationalize that in the data center. That's where Microsoft's Cosmos DB can be very interesting. Uh, I always say, and of course, you know, apologies to President John F. Kennedy that you should ask not what you can do for your platform, but what, what your platform can do for you. Uh, Azure can do a lot here. You don't need to look too much further than Microsoft's Azure Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB, DB refers to a suite of technologies, of course. It describes a single product that can be used in multiple ways. It's a single multimodal, multi-paradigm uh, database that supports uh, SQL queries, graph data access, uh, Cassandra documents, you know, documents, uh, sorry, um, uh, Columnar kind of data, uh, and so on. Uh, according to the product page, you know, Cosmos DB was built from the ground up with global distribution and horizontal scale at its core. It guarantees single digit millisecond read and write latencies at the 99th percentile and guarantees 99.9999 high availability with multi-homing anywhere in the world, all backed by, of course, uh, Microsoft's industry leading and comprehensive service level agreement. Uh, in Cosmos DB, internally, uh, Cosmos DB stores items in containers. So this is a very similar to collections and, uh, sorry, sorry, very similar to documents and collections in MongoDB. You don't necessarily deal with items or containers as the concepts, but they are surfaced in the language of the data model that you're using to consume the data uh, and in, in the portal as well. So when you're, when you're, when you're creating things like that, uh, you'll have to deal with it, right? Containers are grouped into databases, which is sort of like a namespace that are above containers. Uh, and containers can they enforce they can enforce unique key constraints to ensure the integrity of the data. Uh, but containers can also do so much more. You can all, you can ask each container for for example a feed of what's changed. You can use that for example for uh, change data capture uh, schemes where you where you use the deltas of the changes to then do CQRS things like that. Right. Really really interesting possibilities. You can put time delay values caching values for 
data in the containers uh, so that uh, Cosmos DB will automatically expunge existing records after a certain period. Uh, you could also override the, the time to live uh, for specific individual items as well. Um, and so all that is super cool. It's schemaless. That's the thing. It supports multiple kinds of schema, but it itself is fundamentally schemaless. So keep that in mind when using it, right? Keep it in mind because some important ramifications uh, come out of that if you're not prepared. Cosmos DB supports a, uh, a lot of different ways to talk to it. You can actually use the REST API if you want, or you can use a SQL-like database driver. I could actually do another JDBC demo talking to uh, Cosmos DB if I want to. Uh, but instead, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a, a MongoDB-like API. Okay. You can also use uh, the Cassandra API if you want to talk to it as tables, uh, talk talk to it in terms of um, containers and rows as items, right? Uh, if you want to use that, you can. You can even use the Cassandra query language, which I think is super cool. So you can use SQL as well as the Cassandra query language. Uh, you can uh, also use it using the Azure Table Storage API, right? Supporting tables uh, as containers and items as well, you know, just items, right? Uh, Azure Storage items. So uh, we're going to use that here. And again, it's another example of me showing you something really cool that looks like something that's not really cool. Or, I mean, MongoDB is really cool, of course, but it, there's nothing fancy about it. And that's what I love about this, right? We've got uh, a MongoDB running on a local, uh, you know, we've got that. Uh, configured here, Spring Data, MongoDB database, beautiful Cosmos DB, and then URI here, Azure Cosmos DB, MongoDB uh, URI. I've got that here. So if I go back to all services, uh, Cosmos DB, okay, beautiful Cosmos DB. And do I have, whoops, nope, Data Explorer, can I explore? There you go, reservations, documents, and so on. So there's all, you, you can actually query it. This is kind of like the query editor for that. I've got a lot of records there you can see. Um, doesn't matter, okay? Now, I'm gonna use this very similar. I've got the MongoDB jar on the class path, so nothing special required to make it work. The data that I have in that database is of type reservation. It's a document type called reservation, and I'm gonna map it to this Java object here. It's gonna have a monotonically, it's gonna have a UUID rather, uh, ID, and it's gonna have an ID and a name. Uh, I'm using Spring Data MongoDB, I think, so let me make sure I've got that on the class path. Yeah, there it is. Okay. At ID, good, at document. That's a Spring Data MongoDB annotation. Obviously I want getters and setters and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna create a uh, all args constructor and no args constructor and uh, at data and so on. I'm also gonna create a Spring Data repository, right? The repository handles the tedious, sole annihilatingly boring read, write, update, and delete use cases. So reactive. Uh, sorry, not right, it's just a, a CRUD repository, right? For objects of type reservation whose key is of type string. And then from there, I've got this. I can do Cosmos TB demo, okay? Same idea as before, it's Spring Bean that will listen for an event. And then when the event is published, uh, the application context will invoke this. So go Cosmos DB go. And I'm gonna inject the repository there to do the work of talking to that database. Okay, so we say this dot reservation repository at find all. And then for each record that comes back, I'm just gonna print out the results as before. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Let's restart that. And we should see, in addition to talking to SQL Server, we're now actually talking to, oops, we're now actually talking to uh, to Cosmos DB in terms of the MongoDB interface. How cool is that? Okay, there's our customers. Where are the reservations? Did I? get something important. Maybe I should clean up. Let me do something simpler here. I'll do a, a stream dot of uh, A, B, C. And then I'm going to map each one into a new reservation like so. And I'll uh, map that into a record that gets saved into the database like so. Okay. So R, and then uh, for each one of those, I'm going to log the results. Okay, so I'll use system out print line instead. Now, we start. That way, I'll actually ensure that I have data of the right type in the database. I don't think I had in maybe those records were other kinds of data. There we go. 
there's my reservations. They, they got IDs. So obviously I, I created them with a null. They went to the database, they came back with IDs. So that means that they visited the database, did over my SQL data store. Good, so now we've got two different things there. Uh, another thing that you know I'm gonna wanna do at this point is you know suppose I've got a microservice um, and I want one microservice to be able to talk to another. I could create an HTTP REST endpoint, certainly, uh, but a very common way to do this is to use uh, you know, messaging, right? Uh, a lot of use cases, stage event-driven architecture, uh, EDA, event-driven architecture, CQS, command query responsibility segmentation. So a lot of different stories there, a lot of different op opportunities there, but I'm gonna create a, um, a Spring Cloud stream powered integration with uh, the Azure uh, uh, service bus, right? So Spring Cloud stream, actually just service bus demo. There you go, service bus demo. At, and here, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch the message based on a an HTTP call. So public void send. So when somebody makes an HTTP get, I know it's not very restful, but when somebody makes a call to the HTTP get endpoint, I wanna see uh, data you know, being responded to. I wanna see data being processed. And that the thing that's gonna um, uh, consume the data that's gonna be produced by the send endpoint is gonna be an event listener. So I'm, I'll create an event listener here saying public void consume. And here, you know, I'll just uh, have a, a stream listener. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use Spring Cloud Stream. And Spring Cloud Stream is an abstraction. It's an abstraction that allows you to say that I have a backing message thing and it, uh, it can produce data, it can consume data, and I can do so in terms of these generic channels. Now, if you've ever, if you've ever read uh, the Epic um, uh, Enterprise Application Integration book written by Gregor Hope, who by the by, spends a lot of his time in Singapore. I think, I think he's got, I think he lives there you know, now, so it changes, but at one point he lived there, right? Um, yeah, he's in Singapore. Yeah, there you go. I, I bumped into him by accident. I was presenting in <laughs> Singapore last year. I was like, hey buddy, I, haven't, I wasn't expecting to see him. I was actually presenting at his, the office that he was working at, right, at the time, right? And I was like, oh, you work here. That's so random. Like I bumped into my friend from like 10 years uh, in the, just in the middle of Singapore. How cool is that? Um, okay, so, just uh, Josh, you have uh, 10 minutes left. I know. Okay. Oh, awesome. yeah. okay, so I'm gonna send a message out. In order to do that, I need to inject a reference to a source. A source is a producer of messages. Uh, that producer uh, is only possible if I have a binding, right? So what I'm gonna tell Spring Cloud is I'm gonna say, I've got a source and a sync and, okay, that's it, good. These sources and syncs are, they map to, they have their interfaces that have a definition for an output channel and the other one is an input channel and they correspond to these stream bindings spring cloud stream binding input that's the channel interface you saw in the in the code there corresponds to the actual queue in uh, azure service bus called messages queue and the output channel corresponds again to messages queue so i'm going to be it's going to be i'm going to send data on out to messages queue and i'm going to consume data from messages queue right so arguably it should be like that okay um i i have that mind i have that binding in my configuration code, but not my Java code. My Java code is written in a generic fashion independent of the backing message queue. So if I wanted to switch this to Kafka or RabbitMQ or Google Cloud PubSub, again, no Java code would need to be recompiled. I could just change those properties and everything would continue to work. So var message equals message builder. And here I'm gonna say, hello, beautiful Azure at instant now. Come on, you can do this. There, okay, uh, and I'm going to send that message using the channel. So source dot send output dot send uh, message. Okay, so I'm sending the message there, um, and when the data comes back in, I, I'm going to send it by invoking an HTTP endpoint, and then that's going to obviously be routed to a consumer, and my, I'm going to have the same class also be a consumer just to keep the demo simple, and so I'm going to consume the incoming message, which is gonna have a payload of type string. And here I can get access to the uh, headers, right? Okay, org spring framework, framework messaging, get the headers and I can visit each one of those. So system dot out uh, print line, right? Oh no, that's not gonna work. It's gonna be um, it's keys and value, isn't it? Key value, system out dot print line, K equals V, okay? So there's that. And then I can print out the uh, message payload itself. Good. So let's try that. Let's restart the application, see what we get. Uh, 
Alrighty. Now we have to go to the send endpoint, localhost send. And there you go. So I opened up a channel to that. Let me, let me do it in slow-mo here so I can actually have things lined up. I'm going to hit refresh. And you can see that it instantly populates with more data. So every time I hit send, it's creating a new record and it's sending it out to the cloud and coming right back to my local machine. And I can see these things are now communicating with each other. And they're doing so in a generic sort of fashion. Um, and lastly, as we round our tour, I want to show you one more thing. I want to show you how to write stuff to the Azure Object Storage API. And this one, I'm going to actually use the native API, right? This is going to look very similar uh, to nothing, right? This is just going to be the native Azure Object Storage API. So at component class, uh, object storage demo. And here, I'm going to just, um, what am I going to do? I guess I can do it in the constructor, right? Why not? Uh, I'll just do that there. Uh, I'm going to inject a bean. I'm going to inject a, a, a resource, right? I'm going to tell Spring to find a thing that produces bytes and give me a reference to it in terms of the generic resource abstraction. Uh, and I'm going to use that to then uh, copy that data to get an input stream and then copy that data into the cloud. Okay, so container URL, container URL. And in order for this to work, I need to have a cat JPEG. So I'm going to go back to my console here. And I'll take the local file that I've got prepared for this. We're going to talk to the block blob uh, storage mechanism in Azure. Okay, so I happen to think that this cat most most efficiently and correctly uh, epitomizes what it means to be a block blob. So here's my cat. Huh? Huh? Perfect block blob cat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send that thing to the cloud, all fluffy and blocky and all that stuff. Uh, we're going to say um, file copy utils. That's a Spring Framework class, by the way. It's very useful if you never used it before. And I'm going to copy the data from the, the resource, get input stream. Okay, and I'm going to tell tell Java to ignore the to ignore the throwable that's being created there. There's the bytes. Okay, and I'm going to take those bytes. I'm going to upload it to the the platform. So I'll say uh, container URL dot create block blob block blob URL, okay, cat, uh, beautiful cat.jpg, okay, uh, and then I'm going to upload it, and the data that I'm going to upload is a, is the bytes, and I'm going to use this uh, reactive flowable API, so flowable.just byte buffer dot wrap bytes, oh, this part always gets me, um, bytes, please, okay, and then just the length, I think, and then no, no, done yet? No, one more. Okay. Uh, and then from there, blocking get to get the response and just log it out. So system out, uh, upload response dot to string. Okay, now what's the issue? Do you see the problem? It's looking for bytes. So flowable.just wrap. Bytes. Create block blob URL upload. Okay. So what is it looking for? It's looking for bytes that length. Isn't that this? I've got one parameter extra, that's what it is. So this and then, whew. okay, good. So let's run this and see what we get. Now I've got a zero Cosmos DB, I've got a storage here. Storage accounts, is that it? Beautiful storage and uh, open explorer. Do I have explorer? You can run the explorer uh, containers, please. Cats. There's beautiful cat that was uploaded at 5.58 and 17 seconds uh, local time. It's now 5.58 and 35 seconds. There's the beautiful cat. Uh, download, please, quickly. There you go. There's our block blob cat. Thank you, my friends, for your time. I hope you got something out of it. Obviously, we've only begun to scratch the surface. Key takeaways, uh, Azure is an, ex an exhaustive, amazing platform that has 
been matched only by the beauty of the integration for Spring users. Uh, this, the, the most compelling feature always behind a, a technology is the team that works on it. And I know that the team at Microsoft are keen on making this a first class citizen and a first class, first class experience for you. Um, obviously, a lot of open source stuff. You saw that they're not, this is, I spent a lot of time showing you stuff that you could do on your local machine without Microsoft at all, right? That's the whole point. They're trying to make it so that you can run stock standard Spring applications as, as easily and quickly and efficiently as you can in, in the cloud, in production, at scale, uh, a scale that you wouldn't have seen before. I'm happy to answer questions uh, at email, joshlong.com or at starbucksman. Uh, please check out Spring Boot 2.3, check out Spring Cloud for Azure, check out Growl VM support. And uh, I want you to stay safe, flatten the curve, be good to each other, and uh, I'll, hopefully we'll all get to see each other again. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, Vox Day Singapore, for considering me, uh, for having invited me, and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Josh. And it was awesome. And we'll see you guys next week with Sergio Alma on uh, Spring Boot 2.3.0. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you all.